Hello, welcome to my combo lords. Welcome to the combo lord in the comments from Brazil. Always love how widespread the internet lets us have different visitors to my channel and classrooms antics. It's been a sort of drought of combo class content recently because if you caught my last live stream or you're in the Discord, you may have seen me note that I've been sick for a surprisingly long time from some viral thing that I'm still seeing doctors about because it's only like 90% gone. So pardon me if I'm a little coffee or sniffly or anything, but I am finally close enough to better that we can return to live streaming, filming, and stuff like that. Uh, luckily, before I got sick, I had filmed a full episode worth that took me a while to edit, but I did put out a full episode about AI versus mathematics on the Combo Class channel like a week ago. And now finally I can jump into filming the next episode. And the next episode I figured, well, while I'm still sort of regathering my body and brain from this illness, uh, why don't I flash onto some of the thoughts that I explored while I was stuck in bed? A lot of that, like I've mentioned in some recent streams, were some questions I've been asking about numbers that I created from a card game that I'm sort of developing and some different thoughts about how I want to design the cost structure to play or activate certain cards in the game. And I wanted it to be a quite numerical thing so that as I was exploring it or as potentially other players of this game in the future were exploring what the best strategies were and I was exploring it to make sure nothing was overpowered or underpowered, that I, it would still be telling us things about, say, number theory. I wouldn't want it to be so random and, oh, if you have a thing with a squiggly symbol, you get a plus three power, and if you, your thing has a little flame on it, you get to do this. Like, we want something somewhat simple, in a way, that still provides complexity. And so I was looking at combinations of ways you may have resources you could add or multiply together. Say, perhaps, little stacks you're building, and if you build little stacks that are one tall, they could do a certain uh, thing to whatever n amount of energy you have to pay a cost for something. And say, larger stacks maybe would have a different ability, like maybe they don't add their amount, they multiply by their amount. And one crucial thing about this game structure that leads us to the questions in math is that unlike many games, you can't have too much of a cost of energy for whatever you want to pay for. If I need to create the number 12 for a cost, 13 won't do the trick in this game. We need to create an exact cost to clear the pool, then pay another exact cost. We can't get sidetracked from any of the costs we're able to pay. So I was looking at what combinations of things like adding one and multiplying by two and things like that would lead us to which numbers. And in the last live stream I did, I ranted about it a little bit, but it's a little hard to imagine or explain a sort of cool visualization that I had in my head for it. And so uh, I didn't do a great job at explaining the coolness of it in the last live stream because it was sort of a visual thing I was imagining. And so I figured, well, maybe I'll make a little next episode about this, you know, while I'm still half sick and want to cook up some episode or another. Maybe my next episode will be about how some of these patterns I found flashed back to bases. We've looked at other bases many times, like binary and ternary and stuff. And it ends up leading to many patterns that I would have already wanted to say about binary and ternary and things like that. One important detail being things like with binary or ternary, ternary is base three, there is exactly one way to make each whole number. Unless you're counting um, with the decimals, there's the alternate like shadow clone of each number that's point infinite nines, like three equals two point infinite nines. So they all have like another shadow one. But if we're just creating whole numbers without the decimals, there's exactly one way. Okay, and if people don't believe me on that, we did an episode about that like five episodes ago on the Combo Class channel. So I have explained my thoughts about point infinite nines and stuff. Now, with uh, the whole numbers, the fact that binary and ternary can create each number exactly once and that other bases you could cook up wouldn't be as good at it 
ended up relating to which uh, combinations of numbers could create what. So in this live stream, I figured while I chat about some other, you know, recent little stories that have been going on around the classroom and such, uh, we would draw some diagrams such as this one that I created for the thumbnail. And we're going to have to draw really carefully because I'm doing pen on paper for these. Uh, that's going to be easier to save and film over the next week for the, uh, to use them as B-roll in the episode I'm making than on a whiteboard like I often draw my bathy pictures because um, I'm not sure if it's going to rain out here and stuff. And indoors is a whole other crazy story right now. I'll explain in a minute. But uh, on paper, sometimes I try and draw them and I mess them up and then I'm like, God dang it, I gotta restart this whole thing. Uh, this was my second try only because I drew one of the arrows the wrong color the first time. Uh, when I made this, this is burnt now, but this was a few episodes ago and it used to be a whole times table of 15 by 15. That took me like four tries because uh, there was I kept messing up like one digit on a number and I was like, dang it, and got like perfectionist about it. And I'm like, nah, I can't just fix it. I'm, I'm restarting. <laughs> so i got to be careful with the pen on paper. But drawing these diagrams will show us some cool visual patterns that I'm going to use in the next episode. Although, if you watch this stream, still make sure to watch the next episode on the Combo Class channel. Because in this stream, I'm more so going to be showing cool patterns than explaining all the details about how they relate to bases. So, in the episode, you know, we'll fill in the gaps of... Uh, how exactly does this relate to cool things about binary and ternary? But we're going to still see some cool patterns show up with a little game we're going to play. So, for example, the first game we're going to play is what if I have an unlimited, to a degree, amount of two, what we're going to call a numberation. That's the little nickname I whipped up for what we're doing. It's an operation than a number, a numberation. So plus one we'll call a numberation. Uh, divided by two is a numberation. S technically, a lot of things with nicknames are numberations because times two is double, we could nickname. Times three is triple. Uh, to the power of two is square. So a lot of things like squaring something is a numberation because it's to the power of two. Unfortunately, there's not a good nickname for plus one. It's the successor function it's called in math, but like... There should be a better nickname for the number one after the last one because you can call it the successor of the number, but you, you don't say you successor the number the same way that you could use double as like a verb. <laughs> now, so someone said this piece of paper looks kind of like Idaho. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that, but all right. And thank you to everyone else who's catching uh, or leaving random comments. People are saying uh, when they sleep, they just are stuck in bed, sleeping and hallucinating. And I was kind of doing that too, but when I want to like relax, I think about simple numerical patterns. Like it really relaxed me to have the game I was thinking about. So as I was like half conscious, I would be thinking about like, okay, what numbers can we reach with this combo of numberations? And then I would have a dream that would be like really surreal and like, the dream wasn't even like, I am in this room. It would be like, the room is a numberation or something. And like, how can I fit the two rooms together? Or am I a room? Wait, if I'm a room, then I'm plus one. But what's the right? So they'd get really surreal <laughs> when I would dream in between that. I also need to tell you folks about my recurring dreams at some point, because I have this whole recurring set of locations in my head that is very weird that I often go to in dreams that involves this maze-like cabin that is somewhere on the side of a forest that is reminiscent of a lot of places I've visited in my life, but definitely not any of them in particular. And it has some very strange maze-like things in it that whenever I'm in the dream, even if I half know I'm awake, I'm like, I got to get to those weird rooms again. Like, I feel like I'm like gonna discover something interesting about reality or something, even when I know I'm like half dreaming. So I gotta get to those weird rooms, folks. There's some something weird and occult going on in some of those corners of that cabin. Uh, so I'm always really excited when I return there in a dream. Now, 
what is going on on this document? Well, my two numberations I allowed are double and successor, meaning, you know, plus one and times two. We're going to assume we start at zero. And if I allow any plus ones to be unlimited, I don't even need the times twos. We do if we're mapping efficiency, if we're counting like what's the digit sum or something, we would want to use times twos more. And perhaps that would matter in the context of the game. But if our first question is just what numbers can we reach, not how hard was it to get to the number, well, plus one would be too easy to hit every whole number on its own. You just do it as many times as the numbers size. So we have to put some cap on our plus ones. We don't necessarily need to put a cap on the times twos. I mean, if we had times two on its own from zero, we can't get anywhere. Times two on zero, we're still at zero. So let's say that we allow ourselves any number of times twos in a row. And we could stop whenever we're at a number, but we're going to be building it like a tree to see like, well, we could have stopped there or we could continue to there. And we can use plus one in our first scenario only up to once in a row. So if I have plus one, uh, my next thing has to either be I'm done or I times two. Now, can we reach every number from that? And what will we learn by the way we can reach every number? Turns out to be quite interesting. So from zero, I have used red or pinkish double arrows. Uh, I, I like using, like, a lot of my markers are, like, a reddish color and, like, a greenish color. But someone commented on a video once, a reminder, that for colorblind people, those are really hard to distinguish. So I was like, okay, well, try and also make a, even if you couldn't see the colors right, uh, the double arrow for the ones that are doing a times two that are pink. And a single arrow for the ones that are doing a plus one. So from zero, if I times two, it just sends me back there back to zero. If I plus one, though, I get to one. Now, I can't plus one again. We said we can only do it once in a row. So I have to either be at one or I could times two to two. Now I have a choice. Now I can plus one because I get up to one of those in a row or I could times two. And then like from three, for example, I can only times two because to get to three, I had to have my last operation be a plus one. There's not a way to do this to get to three where my last operation was times two, so I have to double it. Now, let's continue this a little bit to see what we're gonna learn. So, here, from six, I can, I have times twoed, so now I can either plus one, and what, what else can plus one? Let's fill those in while we have the marker out. Eight could also plus one. And then any of these can times two. Five can only times two. And six can times two if it wants. So now our new numbers we've gotten are seven, 12, 10, nine, and 16. Let's go one step further before we analyze this. Sev uh, the ones that could plus one are 12. The, the ones that could plus one are the ones that came from a times two. Now, any can also times two. Now, 7 times 2 to 14. 12 could go to 13 or 24. 10 went to 11 or 20, 18, 17, 32. So, here's what we can start to notice. If I looked for which numbers I've hit, 
it seems like I'm hitting them all. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, and fifteen's the first missing one, but it's gonna come from me being able to plus one the fourteen. We're hitting every number, but not just that. We're hitting every number in exactly one way. If I say, I want to get to 10, the only way to do it, apart from being able to times two my zero as many times as I want at the beginning, the only way to really do the rest is plus times times plus times. Or we could categorize it as if we know which ones are plus and times. One, two, two, one, two. That's the only single way to get to each number. They each have exactly one way to get to them. Now, when I realized this, I was like, okay, that seems true. How can I prove this to myself? And I decided I would try and backtrack. If I have a given number, how would I get there if my operations were, you can minus one once, or you can divide by two any number of times. And now I'm trying to get to zero from a number, the other way around. And I realized that an odd number can minus one to an even, and an even doesn't need to do another consecutive minus one. An even can always apply the divide by two operation. If I hit another even, I can go again. And if I hit an odd, since I've just used a divide by two operation, I'm allowed to use my minus one operation. Any odd can calibrate to the even, which can half, half, half until it hits an odd, calibrate to the even, odd, odd, half, 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 calibrate, and get down there. And so I realized, yeah, I'll explain that more in the full episode, the backtracking process, or like half proof I did about that. Uh, remember this... I'll turn this into a much more concise version that also relates to the bases. Uh, when I drop an episode about this on the Combo Class channel sometime in the next week. And here, essentially, I'll skip past that for now, my exact backtracking proof. But I justified to myself that, yes, every number can reach one of these. And I seemed to notice that they could do it a single way, exactly. So, uh, taking a little peek at our comments, somebody said, um, they don't know if I've gone over Pascal's triangle. That's one of the topics that I have so many notes on. I have a book's worth of notes about how Pascal's triangle relates to the polytope numbers, relates to what I call the meta-triangular numbers, relates to various geometry, various combinatorics, and even relates to something I invented that I call a pond forest type of function or graph. Uh, that These are such grandiose notes I've made that I've been procrastinating my episodes, not episode, episodes that will involve Pascal's triangle because it's either going to be like a whole documentary length thing or going to be like multiple episodes over the course of sometime in this grade or next grade, starting with how it relates to triangular numbers and how triangular numbers relate to square numbers and etc. So we will have a lot of cool stuff about Pascal's triangle and it did even show, oh, another one, how it relates to Sierpinski's triangle and fractals if you apply modular arithmetic. So there's a lot of crazy stuff with it that we will certainly go over. I'll take a look at if I know the one you're mentioning or not too. There's many other triangles as well. A Catalan triangle, uh, many cool triangles. Somebody's saying times two is equivalent to left bit shift and plus one sets the rightermost bit to a one. And they are on the right track. Mike Bolt here is noting that if we were imagining this in binary, plus one is like taking the last digit from a zero to a one, and times two is like adding a zero at the end. And this relates to, in a way, this is like a simplified version of a Colatz conjecture type question when you're looking at what numbers you can reach. And I did an episode somewhat recently on the Combo Class channel 
about how the Colatz conjecture should be taught involving binary and that it much simplifies the pattern. And this episode will be in a way a follow-up to that because the patterns are quite similar. What we're going to look at next, though, is we don't just have to consider binary because stuff like the Colatz conjecture or this question were inherently about times twoing. And in fact, the up to one plus oneing is quite important as well. That represents, in a way, that binary numbers only require the digit zero, meaning we didn't do a plus one, or one, meaning we did it once, uh, to capture any whole number. So, essentially, we are building this as a binary number. If I wanted to know how to build 10, I said the only way to get there was 1, 2, 2, 1, 2, twos being doubles. That's because the binary representation of 10 is 1, 0, 1, 0. So I started at 0, I created a 1, I slid it over, I slid it over, I put a 1 at the end, I slid it over. So, that is, again, stuff that I will say in a much more concise as well as visual way when I make a mini episode about this, uh, because a mini episode on this topic will be a lot more doable than trying to go jump into some of the other really long ideas I've been ready to film, uh, because we're still only 90% recovered from some sort of virus or whatever. But looking at how this related to binary, well, in fact, I kind of want to, uh, maybe I'll, oh God, I'm crushing all my papers. Um, I kind of want to show a version of this in binary. So just to draw this real quick to short, sort of fully show how it links over real quick before we go into another type of thing. Let's look at how they look at, how they look in binary. So like here, we added a one, or if we add another zero at the end, that doesn't do anything because just what's considered a leading or trailing zeros are usually when it's after the decimal. So this one we could call a leading zero. And so you see the, the pink arrows are adding a zero at the end. They're sliding it over. It's adding a zero at the end is also the same as hopping the decimal point to the right because there's an infinite amount of trailing zeros. So it's like hopping the decimal point over or like bumping all of the digits in the number over without moving where the decimal was. Uh, so either the decimal or the number can move, but they're like shifting in comparison to each other. Now, this train down here like 16 is 1000 and we're not gonna have room to write all this because we already got cramped when we were uh, trying to write base 10 numbers and binary numbers of more digits so we're not gonna uh, go that many layers deep but we'll we'll finish this layer from eight we could also go to nine is 101 um, uh oh did I mess up no that's four that's five that's eight Nine would be 1001. Yeah, okay, we're okay though. I wrote it right. And then 11, we have to add a zero because we already applied the other operation. So, all right. Um, we have actually, we have enough room for just one more layer. So bear with me. It's going to look a lot cooler if I add just one more layer. Um, I wanted to show it get down to 10 because I like that example. Um, this one could go 1, 1, 0, 0, or 1, 1, 1. What's cool also is here, when we write it like this, since we're hitting every number, and because bases work like this, here we're hitting every combination of zeros and ones, and here we're hitting slower 
every combination of zeros through nines. If you look at like what digits are in them. So this is a good starter pack for the first, this is going to help me as a prop a lot too, for the first couple minutes of that episode I'm cooking up. But like I said, uh, if you think you've already seen the stream and then you see me drop an episode on a seemingly similar topic, trust me that it won't only be more concise. It'll also have a lot more fun facts and details. So this is a binary type pattern I found, but it wasn't the only one I found because times two wasn't the only operation I considered. Here's a little brain teaser for you. Uh, before I'll answer it in one second, but for anyone who wants to tease their brain for a moment. What if I had times three instead of times two? Could I hit all the numbers if I can do up to one plus one at a time? If not, could I hit them all with up to two plus ones at a time? If not, how many do I need? So tease your brain with that for a moment. Actually, I do actually have to grab my phone charger. So that's gonna be a brain teaser to think about for a moment, leave a comment about. What types of plus ones would be necessary if tripling is our operation instead of doubling as far as the bigger thing? Now, after another question, if you want to really tease your brain that I'm still figuring out is which ones of these minimize digit sums in certain ways, not digit sums of the numbers we're hitting, but of the operations in a way of like the number applied to the numberation. Like if each plus one counts as one cost or one point I had to have of one coin I needed or whatever. And each uh, two is two. Like what 10 would take me one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight to get there on with my numberations being this. But what with my other numberations? Uh, with my times threes, can I get to 10 faster, you know, or equal or slower? And in general, it's very interesting because it, we're tweaking patterns that relate to something called integer complexity that will get its own episode someday that is sort of related to this, but it lets you sort of m m use only ones you need because you're allowed to use as many pluses as you want and you're allowed to use parentheses as much as you want. And using all the parentheses is really interesting and lets you hit more numbers in different ways and leads to some really cool questions, but that's a little less related here because this was stemming from a game I was developing. The game is already going to be unbelievably mathy that it's gonna scare away a lot of people who don't like numbers. And I, it made it way too mathy to have you able to like be inserting parentheses in stuff, let alone harder to represent on a board state. So, we were going with for now you'd need some special card if you want to link this to add to that and have built them separate or something we'll say you know you can't just have we're using numberations not just operations we don't just have something that's like plus and whatever here was all parentheses and whatever there was all parentheses that may be its own card in the game but it's not inherently in the rules in the rules we're sort of going linearly using different edits. Now, in general, what if I had all of the times is available? Like to get to, you know, 27, the quickest would be plus one times three times three times three. And threes maximize some stuff because of its closeness to E actually, believe it or not. We'll explain that in the integer complexity episode. But threes don't maximize everything. It was best at 27, partially because that's a power of three. Twos maximize other stuff. Fives hit certain things in a good way. And so what is your best way to get to a number if you're like, have certain limits on how many pluses you can do in a row and then you can multiply, but we're considering what number we multiplied by and trying to minimize all those. Like, you know, if I ended up going plus one times five, plus one times three plus one, I'd be at 19. But that might not be the fastest way to get there. So thank you all for leaving comments and hanging out while we draw these pictures and stuff. I need to grab my phone charger and stuff. So leave comments if you have any thoughts about the easier question 
uh, what's going to happen when I have this be a triple arrow, and the harder question of what greater patterns are at play. I'll be back in just a few minutes.
right, folks, we are back and programming the computer. Better watch out for all these. Uh, <laughs> I have like 20 calculators and five knives and six clocks on the desk, approximately. So, and like 200 dice, so you gotta be careful. Anyway, um, <laughs> if you don't believe me, I actually do have all that junk on the table. <laughs> But, um, anyway, uh, I know the knives are not from me being a serial killer or anything. That's not the case. I am a good man. Uh, the knives are because my family's kitchen started collapsing, so we are hiring a family friend to reconstruct part of the kitchen. And we were like, well, we have all these extraneous stuff in the kitchen that isn't good. Like, these knives are all dull. And so... A dull knife is far more dangerous than a sharp knife. A sharp knife goes where you want it to. A dull knife will flip whatever direction it wants to. All right, so people are looking at the shortest trees for threes and ones to obtain whole numbers and such. That is pretty awesome. But what we're going to start with before we worry about um, maximizing things like the digit sum of the numberations, we're just gonna see what numbers can we hit if we had times three and only a single plus one in a row again. So let, maybe we should use a, what color does this one look like? This purple, ah, it's too dark. No, okay, same color. We, we just know that it's triple now. I'll try and draw a triple arrow. So if we start with what we're gonna look at here, you'll really quickly notice that we're not gonna hit all the numbers when this is allowed. We have, here from zero, same thing, times three does not help. That sends me to itself, but plus one will get me somewhere. And plus, where's my green one? Hmm, need some consistency. Where's that green marker? Here we go. Oh, okay. Now that can plus one once and get us to one. But here's a little problem. Can't get to two. It's like, dang it, I can't get to two. Now this is actually a really big clue that we can't get to the number two. If I ask in a minute, what type of number can't we get to? Remember that clue that we couldn't, the first one we couldn't get to was two. Now, uh, we can't get to two. So from one, we basically have to, oh, the squirrel's here. I, oh man, I, I don't have any, okay. I'll just be one second. I gotta grab a nut. The nuts are right inside. Squirrel's right here. Um, where'd you go? Okay, I, I need to grab nuts because they're in the vicinity. Oh, there's a nice bird here, too. Where'd you go, squirrel? Oh, it was a big one. It was like one of the adult ones. There's a, squirrels are all over these days. Oh, <laughs> I'm gonna compile a squirrel episode soon about my process of uh, befriending squirrels. And I have some great footage of that. I put some on my Patreon like a week ago, but uh, I haven't put it in a main episode yet. But I have all this footage of the squirrels are so chill around my cats even. They will just like, so the squirrels and cats will be right next to each other. No trouble. Oh, it's all the way up there. I see it. The squirrels are up there in the tree looking down. Hey, do you see it? It's like eating something from the tree, which is good because that's, you know, even better than cracking the walnut I'll give it is natural hunting, which they do as well. You have to make sure that they also know how to naturally hunt. Come down here, buddy. 
When you want, I got a treat for you. Okay. Oh, hey, look, Sassafras is here. You get to be in the episode too because you also, he was a stray cat and he got adopted about a year and a half ago. And now he is a monster of pure love. He is just, he loves getting pets and he's a little angel. Hey, Sass. Who's a good Sassafras? He's so nice. He copied his brothers who, well, I don't know if they're actually his brothers or not, but Sage and Dandelion, my original cats. Well, he got a little spooked right now, but he is such a love lord. He will come just like begging to get cuddled all morning now. And he was the most scared little feral stray before. And he's never bit or scratched me. He's so nice. So that's a good little sassafras over there. You can come back. Oh, he's also trying to play with the squirrels. He like chases them a little bit, but they're not even scared because they don't, oh, the squirrels so are weird now. Look, it's like coming down the other way. It's coming down that tree up there. Do you see it? Come here. I got a nut. Come here. Where are you? Oh my God, Sassafras just went on the fence now. <laughs> I guess we're having our nature break. What are you doing up there, man? Hey, Sassafras. He is so good. He, I can't believe he used to be feral. He like comes when he's called and stuff. Where did the squirrel go? Got enough for you. Eh. I guess we'll go back to drawing our uh, number lines and stuff. But that's a fun little nature break. I don't know if you could see the squirrel at all. I'm sure it's gonna come back though. So if I have plus times three and plus one, uh, somebody said, sorry about my kitchen. They hope no one was hurt. Yeah, it didn't like collapse all at once. It was just like the parts were really old. So they st were starting to stop working one at a time. And like sometimes drawers would fall out and stuff, but no one got like hurt or anything. Um, so it's, it was more of a slow and steady collapse. Don't worry. And now um, it'll be better soon. And we're getting rid of random stuff like all the knives I now have to figure out what to do with. So about the numbers, yes, we are looking at numbers as well. And if I have my times three and my plus one as my possible numberations, What's the best way for me to face this for you folks? Cause I, it's hard to like face the camera some way and I can write that way too, but I think this should work. Now, from here, I can now go to only times three. That's my only option from there because I already used my plus one. We're first testing if I only had up to one plus one in a row and all the times threes. What type of numbers do you think I will not be able to hit versus be able to hit. Uh, it was really interesting when I had the like realization. It was one of those like, oh yeah, of course. But I had never thought about that before. And that is when I, that's a big mood that we try and get on this channel is if you can feel, oh, of course that's true, but I've never thought that before. That's a pretty good, important feeling. Now, from three, we can plus one to four, or we can times three to nine. Now from four, we used up our plus one. So we're only going to be able to times three, whereas nine's gonna have more options. Nine can uh, times three, where'd my green go? Where's my green marker? Oh man. Why does the green one keep vanishing? Okay, so nine can go there, and that was supposed to be an arrow. So four was able to triple to 12. 
9 could plus 1 to 10. We can reach 10 this way, so if you're a, a big fan of 10, we can still get there, but uh, not going to be able to hit 11. 9 times 3 gives us 27. And let's go one layer deeper. So 27 is going to be able to do either type. This one's only going to be able to triple. This one's going to be able to do either type. Because remember, we're only allowed one plus one in a row for what we're testing here. This leads us to 13, 36, 30, 28, 81. Nah, don't worry, I'm not actually that quick at math if it wasn't a power of three. I just like my powers of three. And here we have a certain set of numbers that we're, we've been reaching. And a certain set of missing numbers that we're not going to hit. If we notice here, we've sort of like used up all the options from this row. So everything under 13, for example, that we haven't hit is missing. In fact, we should go just one layer deeper because it's going to make things even a little more clear. Uh, we're going to have to write it quite small. This goes to 243. Once again, I only know that because threevens are cool, and this is a purely threeven number, a power of three. Uh, <laughs> we get 82, and we get... Uh, 28 was only able to triple. So that one I actually have to like math in my head. 60 plus 24 is 84. And these ones were triples. This one's going to be allowed to triple. Well, all of them are allowed to triple. We didn't have a restriction on that. Uh, so this one gets to 39, and this one gets to, uh, well, I need to add more arrows because it also had another option. and times three, just 90. All right, so at this point, the reason I went that high is that we can now see that any number all the way up to 31, any number under 31 that hasn't been found yet won't be found. So we could like sort of compile a list of missing numbers in a way and I suppose I won't write them on here because when I make this as a prop in the episode, I'll just write it on a whiteboard nearby or something. But if we look at the missing numbers, maybe I won't answer this question right away. If somebody wants to put it in the comments, they can feel free because it's not like a secret. Um, but also maybe we could leave it for some people to figure out themselves. I will answer it in the next combo class episode, but if you want a brain teaser, maybe I'll leave this one open for a couple of days before we go to the next one. What is in common with the numbers that are missing here? Like two, five, six, seven, eight, 11, 14, 15. There's like some in a row that works sometimes and some stretches that don't. What's in common with the ones that do or don't work here. And it does relate to base three, the way that those other things related to base two. Now, that question I'll just answer in the episode, I suppose, but now we're gonna fix that problem. To fix the problem of having missing numbers, it turns out what we need to do is just allow up to two plus ones in a row. Now, if I do that, I'm allowing, I can triple at any point, or I can do plus one, unless I've already plus one twice as the last ones. So here, 
as usual, my multiplier sends me to zero. My adder sends me um, downward as my only starting option. But now I have a branch a little earlier than before because now I could plus one a second time or I could triple. So if I triple, I hit three. If I plus one, I hit two. Now, note I'm writing this one a little smaller because I kept running out of room. You know, you uh, sometimes you learn from your mild mistakes. Sometimes your, your tenth thing is better than your second thing. Now, we're going to... Now we can't... This one, we can't plus one. We can only, we already plus one twice in a row to get to two. We can only triple it. But it turns out that's kind of good here because remember we had a cool trait about the times two one where we hit every number exactly once. If I was allowed to plus one three times here, I'd be able to hit three a different way. But right now, at least so far, I can't. I can only times two, I mean times three the two, whereas the three has both options. And what numbers does this send us to? Well, let's see, this sends me all the way up to nine. This sends me to four, and this sends me to six. From there, any of them can plus one or times two because we haven't had any two in a rows up to that point. But next, we're going to have a little limit on that because this thread did have a two in a row latest. And this sends us to, these are the triplers and these are the plus ones. And now we're going to go one layer deeper. Maybe I'll end up going two, but probably just one deeper because this one branches a lot more. Almost all of them could have plus one or times two. Like that one could, that one could. That one can't, because to get there, we had just done two in a row. We're going to have to write these really small, folks. Maybe I should have made the paper that way. So, seven gets me to, we'll do the plus ones first. Now we'll do the triples. Uh, let's see, 30, uh, 54. So, at this point, we're like, okay, well, we've gotten up to the smallest number in our latest row is eight. So, if we've hit all the numbers, we better have hit all the ones up to eight by this point, because otherwise it's going to be too late. So, looking at them, we did hit them all. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And, in fact, we, we got a few more in a row here. We got up to 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. 14 is our next missing one, but we will hit that because we can plus one the 13. We've only done it once in a row at that point. So, these are, these are going to hit every number. Now that we've allowed up to two plus ones in a row and a times three in a row, and this, once again, I'm not going to fully explain until I make the little episode about it, but I think a lot of you could connect the details if you uh, understood that binary part earlier, that by being able to plus one twice and by being able to triple, we're secretly representing base three or ternary. And base three is able to represent each whole number in a singular way, not counting those secret shadows of point infinite nines because we're just doing whole numbers for now. So, there's that. What if I had written one of these in base 3? 
Well, maybe, maybe we should do that. I think even though this is going to reveal one of those questions right now, trust me, there'll be plenty of other facts in the episode that are unrevealed. Uh, we're going to write this one in base three because it's going to show the pattern. So this is the one that we only allowed plus one once in a row. And so now we had some missing ones. So we had zero. I'm just going to translate the numbers, then write the arrows. Uh, zero, one, three in base three will be 10. And okay, once again, I'm not going to be able to fit all of them. So we're going to have to go one row shorter. So I'm translating these to base three. It's gonna take me one second to make sure I get them right. I mean, the pattern is actually relatively simple, but I just gotta make sure I don't screw it up somehow. Now, what do we have here? First, let me write which ones were uh, tripling and which ones were adding. So here, what do we have? Well, this looks mighty similar to something we drew before. Wait a minute. These are the same diagram because whenever we, well, apart from one difference that this one, they have three notches on the arrows and this one, they have two notches on the arrow. Oh no, what did I do? Why did I double notch these arrows? Dang it, those aren't supposed to be double notched. All right, I'm gonna, just cause I am gonna use these as a prop, I'm gonna rewrite this one real quick so it's not really confusing. Um, but uh, I'll explain while I'm rewriting it. So it, the one that I created for tripling and doing a single one or doubling and adding a single one looked the same when I translated one to base three and one to base two. And um, that's because it ended up being the same process. In base three, tripling shifted it. Like in base two, doubling shifted it. Plus one put a one on it. But what's the difference here? The difference is that in binary, those digits are the right amount. That's just enough, zeros and ones. In ternary, that's not enough. You can't make all your numbers with zeros and ones. So essentially the answer to one of the questions we were posing of what type of numbers were missing when we could triple or add one up to a single time in a row, the type of numbers that were missing are numbers that contain the digit two when written in base three which is such a specific, like, like when I was designing something for my card game, that's the, like, it's just so specific of a certain aspect of number theory that I like, specific of the type of thing I would cover on my channel. And so when I was designing this like card game, like thing, oh, I did those wrong. Cause I, those are supposed to be red. 
That was why I messed it, this one up. I'm messing them up in multiple ways. Okay, I'll have to fix these ones later. These ones are going to get fixed. <laughs> um, I'll fix it while I'm uh, chatting because it, it gives me something to do. But I got to be careful, like I said. When I mess one up, if I'm going to use it as a prop, I don't want an inaccurate mathematical prop or a really confusing one. So then I'm like, all right, got to half talk, half focus on this. But the, the point, which will be summarized better in the upcoming episode, is that I stumbled into these things that were like, well, if I had these resources, or as I was nicknaming them, tree sources, as we'll see why in the game I'm developing, although that's no longer the nickname that makes sense for them, but I'll explain more about the actual system of the game at some point, either in this episode or another one. But the important part is, or not even the important part, but one of the fun parts was that I stumbled into, as I was trying to develop what would make a good game, something that related to something that was just like straight out of what I would discuss on my channel. Which numbers contain the digit two when written in base three? But that's the thing about math is that if you look hard enough, you'll start seeing that stuff a lot of places. It sometimes kept feeling coincidental when I would be like, Oh my God, I keep seeing like modular arithmetic everywhere or whatever. But then I was like, okay, maybe I'm just thinking about modular arithmetic a lot and it is always everywhere. And it's just um, something, there's a lot of things that are always everywhere. Like sometimes I'll look at a shadow or like the dust in the sunlight and I'll be like, wow, that is so complex of a visual thing going on. How am I not normally paying attention to this? Either in a good way, like enjoying it, or like distracted by it. Like when you look at certain things, there's so much going on. Like, oh, if I look at the sunbeams, I can stare at that at any point. If I look at the shadows, I can stare at that. If I listen to the noise, like I haven't even been really paying attention to all the bird sounds in the background right now because there's so much always going on. But when you look in that so much, sometimes you also find strange mathematical patterns, like a lot of different places, including trying to develop a fun card game. We may find things like the set of numbers that can't be represented in base three, or the set of numbers that can be represented in base three without the digit two using the whole number parts, no point infinite nines. Or in base three, it wouldn't be point infinite nines, it would be point infinite twos, you know? So if I was saying point infinite nines, remember that in binary, that's actually point infinite ones. Okay, now we're gonna make a very silly version of a diagram. This one is like, I don't even know if this is gonna fit, but it's really gonna drive the point home for some people. What if our operations were, oh no, this is not going to fit. Okay, I wanted to try and do a base 10 one, but there's no way it would fit. Because if my operations are, you can times 10 any amount of times, or you can plus one up to nine times in a row, then it's going to be such a big tree before I hit the number nine because to hit the number nine, I'm going to have to go down all nine of the plus ones. And so by the time I get to nine, I'm also going to have had these whole other chains of numbers. That's not going to fit on this. Uh, so no, no base 10 ones. That's for the imagination. But uh, I will make some more diagrams that will demonstrate this for other bases and patterns. And what I'm also curious about is what about other combinations of operations? Like if I just had squaring a number and plus one up to a given amount of times, I wouldn't be able to reach everything because uh, the squaring exponential stretches in a way that the multipliers don't. But what combinations of strange numberations could or couldn't create interesting things? Uh, or create all the numbers or whatever. Well, 
for one, um, the next step I was thinking about, another question is, what if we're trying to minimize? What if I have all of these different charts available? I could, uh, I could have done tripling and plus wanting twice, or I could have done doubling and plus wanting which times. Which numbers are which of these paths faster at hitting? Like some numbers, faster needs a quantifier. So we'll say that like, let me explain to a degree how I imagine is a much simplified version of a system that might be in the game I'm developing. These are magic cards, they're not my game, but uh, I was using these as a demonstration the other day. Uh, let's say this is my hand. Well, let's say sometimes, like in a much simplified version of this, let's just say up to once per turn, I, in addition to maybe playing stuff that might have a cost, I put face down things. And these are like my resource mountains. And I can either make a new hill with my face down or I can stack on a hill. So I could make one taller. And let's say that I can like activate them in a given turn to create a number. But let's say for now, as one variation that I'm testing out of many, that like we were saying here, maybe you can only do one plus one at a time and perhaps only the single hills, the small ones, can plus. They plus one. Other cards may edit your abilities. They may allow other hills to do things. But let's say that a, a mountain with more than one in it, if we activate that, multiplies whatever number we have going on by that amount. And that one of these, we're only allowed to use up to one in a row, and they add one. That is one simplified version of uh, a type of system I've been exploring for games. And that will be, in the game I'm developing, it's going to have squirrels, it's going to have ghosts and weird stuff. Maybe the ghosts, I don't know. It's going to have cool plants and animals and create. It's going to be very mathematical and have a lot of strategy. Uh, it's going to scare a lot of people away because of the math, but I think my combo lords will uh, like it. Now, if I had that, like, what numbers are easiest to hit which ways? Like, one, two, three, I can go, or w let's say I have one, one, two, three. I can now go like, that's a pretty powerful start because I could go two, which is like plus one then times, or three, or I could go four, because plus one times three plus one, or I could go, can I go five? Can't go five with these. So, but if I had stacked them differently, I could have. So this, this stack wouldn't be able to hit five, but I could hit six and I could hit seven. So, which piles would be maximal at hitting which numbers. Now, in the game, there will also be some differences of that being the only strategy you use because to a degree, some of the animals are going to live on top of these mountains. And having a higher height of mountain that some of the animals are on will give them a stronger effect. So having your mountains taller may be... Um, like encouraged in a certain way, but to a different degree, other factors of the game may encourage you to go wider and have like a lot of ones and twos. Um, Cause they maximize different things with, this is the widest making only ones. This is like the minimal multiplicative base is having a bunch of twos involved somehow. And threes, I swear that their proximity to the number E gives them these superpowers that we'll go into in some episodes later. But then sometimes higher stacks are useful too. But like to make five useful, I would have to stack past four, which isn't as useful. So we have to like think, to, oh, to get to a five, I have to kind of almost waste a little time on a four because like a, a four isn't really better than two twos, but or sometimes it could be. So there's various rules I've considered too for, you know, to what degree I restrict ones from uh, going in a row, to what degree I restrict the taller ones from ever adding and other things. There's a lot of pros and cons I'm juggling, but that, that's an example of one of the variations that led me to like, oh my God, I'm developing a game and I found these cool trees that relate to bases. So that will be polished up in the next episode. That will be, uh, so I don't have much of it filmed yet. I've 
very recently it started to feel 90% better from sick instead of like 60% better. And so I will be um, filming that in the next couple of days a bit and hopefully I can get that out in less than a week, the next one. And I'm going to do some editing in the next day or two as well and do put out a few short type things that I've filmed from extra stuff and maybe some random bonus videos. Now, let's see, what else do we have going on in the combo classroom? Um, I think what I'm gonna do is take a quick breather to grab some water, like a two minute break, and then just chat about a few stories of some random recent stories and opinions and things for anyone who, um, Probably, you know, maybe we'll doodle some more patterns, but uh, mostly maybe just some chatting for the later portion of our stream. If anyone leaves early, reminder to stay tuned, especially on my Combo Class channel, but also on this one. And that if you look in the description, there are all sorts of other cool uh, community type things for us, like uh, the Discord and Patreon and subreddit and such. So, oh no, I got ink on the trackpad here on the computer. Here, let me try. I'm trying to wipe off some ink on the computer thing. Um, oh, whoa! I was like wiping it off, uh, scarily close to pressing the um, stop streaming button. Don't worry, I won't intentionally do that. So, um, I'm gonna take like a two minute breather. I'll be back to chat a bit for any combo lords who just want some more stories and opinions, and maybe uh, the squirrels will come to grab some nuts and stuff. Uh, if you leave early, stay tuned for more content coming out soon now that I'm better. But some more fun stuff to talk about.
All right, combo lords. Well, we chat for the rest of our stream and tell some little stories. I will begin by fiddling around with a few of the things that I was given for the holiday season. Oh, this thing I popped out earlier was given by a combo lord, George Caruzzi, which is my fun Toro Flux. This thing I've brought to parties and inspired multiple of my friends to buy their own. So I'm like seriously helping the Toro Flux manufacturers. Uh, I, I, the funny thing is I've actually turned down and ignored many brand deals that offered me money because they want to put things on my combo class channel. Um, and they're not like related products. It's like, you know, all the ads on YouTube, it's like VPNs and websites for random educational companies and stuff. And some of that stuff, like I liked the, the sites or the people or whatever, but I've turned down and ignored many because I didn't want to put ads in my combo class channel unless utterly necessary. I see that the content on there is like little finished works of art I've made and they feel like tainted if I put like a VPN ad in the middle of them or whatever. Maybe we'll have to do that if I need to like pay medical bills someday or whatever. But for now, we've avoided that. However, if any toy manufacturers want to do a miniature sponsor where they just send me some free toys and I talk about it in a live stream. Boy, send me some Toro Fluxes. I'll promote you all day in, in some random live stream. Uh, if it's like a product I like like this. <laughs> this is a product I fully endorse. <laughs> and um, I, I've, I've definitely made multiple sales for them by getting a bunch of my friends to buy these. Anyway... Uh, that I had already gotten. Some of the things that I showed a little bit in the last stream that I should hang up somewhere soon are this little bee ecosystem, which we'll find a good place to hang up soon. Bees are very important. Some people are scared of bees, but honeybees are your friends. Wasps are neutral. Wasps are sometimes your friends, sometimes not. Wasps are a little underrated, if anything, because they do pollinate. But as far as them being, pardon my language, assholes, uh, that is properly rated. Wasps are kind of assholes. Uh, but they do pollinate, at least. But honeybees are nice, actually. Honeybees are cool. And so uh, we're making a helping the bees. And we're going to someday do an episode where it's all about the bees. But I, I have certain visions in my head of episodes I want to do someday. And I just have a vision in my head that... If and when I make an episode about bees are important, we should help their habitats. That I will have some scene where I'm in a beekeeper suit surrounded by a scary amount of bees. So uh, once we set that up, we'll do the episode. <laughs> um, actually, I'm going to have to convince Carlo, my main camera guy. He, he's like not at all scared of most animals, but he doesn't like the little stinging insects as much. So. He said if you if if you had a bee suit, you'd be down. Now, um, anyway, the other thing that actually makes more sense to fiddle around with while I talk, because it's like a fiddly thing, is this little puzzle I'm supposed to try and take apart. And there's also a cool cube that is also similar to something that uh, that classic combo Lord George Carosi got me before that I need to get my other cube together because the manufacturers claim that when you combine multiple of these, you form a new dimension. Uh, I doubt the language there, but I'm still curious if they're uh, describing anything close to uh, that they combine in a cool way or if that was just a marketing gimmick about the new dimension to try and sell one of each color. But I'm, I am glad to have two colors now. These are very fun to fiddle around with. And... I did get these for Hanukkah. My family, like I've said, celebrates sometimes a strange mix because, you know, if you go back to... Cultures are weird. How far do you go back to look at what people celebrated? If you go back to my grandparents, uh, one of the four was Christian and three of the four were Jewish. And so that's about the ratio we celebrate. We, like, about three quarters of the time celebrate... Hanukkah and a quarter of the time celebrate Christmas and sometimes we do a mix where it's like we give like just like, you don't need to give some huge gifts to the people who you're already trying to like share your resources with and you know that like if you buy a gift that you're like straining both of your resources so we try not to give each other like huge crazy gifts and we'll give like something little sometimes on Hanukkah and something else little on Christmas oh I made the rhombic dodecahedron it's hollow, so it's bigger than the cube looks. This thing makes a lot of cool shapes. 
I, I, I will endorse this company too, although I will continue to mock the language on their box about the other dimensions and the rare earth magnets. Um, <laughs> and so with that stuff, uh, we have a little Christmas tree. We, we also lit what's called the menorah for the Jewish faith. This is going to be getting mildly political for a moment, but I do have to note that as a Jewish person, uh, celebrating Hanukkah and being Jewish and stuff like that does not mean I support a lot of the things going on in the world caused by the Israeli government at the moment. Uh, there's a lot of strange sentiments going around related to wars these days that uh, certain I'm just going to cut to the chase that I think the Israeli government is doing a lot of really bad stuff, but then other people say you're not allowed to criticize that or you're being anti-Semitic and you're hating Jewish people. Well, they're not allowed to say that to me because I am Jewish. So I'm going to say that, you know, the Israeli government is doing some really, really bad stuff in the world. And as a Jewish person, if I'm ever celebrating Hanukkah or whatever, uh, it is not endorsing that sort of thing. Now, in any case, holidays are a good time for people uh, to, in the cold winter months, light some candles and give some gifts and eat some bigger meals than usual. Funny little story, I guess. Well, I was sick yesterday. So, okay, there's like a, a series of mildly chaotic events. So I'm like, okay, they're doing construction in my kitchen. So I, cause like I said, the family friends like fixing all this stuff in there. So I wasn't able to use the kitchen. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna go out and get some food at a restaurant around here. Um, and like, I don't even eat out that much. I usually like cooking, but this week I've had to eat out a bit because they're working in the kitchen. So I went and I was like, I'm still feeling pretty sick. I need something like really soothing. I'm gonna go to this Vietnamese place near me and get some like soothing calm, like rice noodle thing. Uh, so I ordered, it was, uh, it's called a bun, is like a Vietnamese vermicelli rice salad type thing. And they accidentally gave me the wrong dish and it was to go, so I didn't notice till I was home. And it was like a fancier dish on the menu. So like normally I wouldn't, you know, have any problem with it and didn't fully have a problem because it was like a, a more expensive dish than what I ordered they gave me. I, it was the right name. They just like somehow got the dish completely wrong. But instead of the like bun vermicelli, they gave me this like spicy clay pot Mongolian beef with these like massive red peppers. And I was like, oh my God, I needed something like soothing on my throat. So I'm like trying to eat this like, like the spiciest yet like fanciest dish on their menu and being like, okay, should I feel appreciative about this error? Or is this just a punishment from the universe? So then later I'm like, I couldn't finish that. I need to cook some other mild leftovers before I get all the spicy stuff in my gut. And so in the kitchen now, like the workers are done, but we still have all of our kitchen gear in like the other side of the living room that's connected to the kitchen. And it's a small ish uh, living room kitchen combo. Like they're one room together. So it's like all the stuff's on one side of the living room. So we've been using some paper plates because like all this silverware is like, we can't use the sink and stuff. And so I'm trying to cook some leftovers with the paper plate. And then I like, was also heating up some tea and I was like getting ready to try and scoop. I, the countertop is only wood now. So I didn't want to spill anything on the countertop. Cause I'm like, I don't want to ruin it before they put like a new counter on. And so I have like the plate on the stove, but I'm also cooking tea. And so the, I didn't notice, but the plate, the paper plate lights on fire because it was touching the burner that was making the tea. And so I'm just like, oh my God, oh my God, the paper plate's on fire. And so I like grab it and try and fix everything. And I get these leftovers I was trying to cook like everywhere over this like wooden unfinished counter. And I'm like, oh God, I gotta like hyper clean this to make sure that it doesn't like, I don't want like mold in the middle of the counter before they put the finishing thing on it. And there's just like fire and the stuff everywhere and my throat's burning from this Mongolian beef. So that, that was a mild comical series of events that happened. But uh, normally I, I do like cooking. Once the kitchen is refurbished, maybe we will make uh, even more 
sorts of cooking tutorials, or perhaps we'll even do those out here on a campfire because it can be fun to cook stuff on a campfire. I would love to do more cooking tutorials someday because I feel like I've picked up a lot of uh, tips or hacks just through practice. I have uh, just done a lot of cooking to save money throughout life and because yeah, it's fun messing around with food and flames. So anyway, um, as far as our comments, uh, welcome to whoever's new if you're still around. Somebody asked how tall I weigh. That's not really a cohesive question. Uh, how tall I am? Um, I don't know if I'll give you an exact answer. I don't need like all my body stats everywhere online, but I'll say I'm a little shorter than you might expect. I'm on the shorter side of average. Um, how much do I weigh? Normally I weigh like 135 or 140, but right now I weigh like 145 because I have a little bit more of a gut than typical. But in 2024, we're going to get ripped. At the end of 2023, I'm going to take some of those like classic trope cheesy like before photos for a before and after because I have like an actual bit of a gut. I'm not going to be faking anything, but I'll take a picture at the end of 2023 of how I've gotten a bit larger than normal and we're going to get ripped in 2024. We're going to get in good shape because I've had times in the past where I was in really good shape and I had like a six pack and stuff. But then I had a lot of hard times in my life and I went through multiple surgeries about two years ago or even closer to one year maybe than two years ago. And so that set me back a bit. But we're, we're going to get back to having that six pack and such. Now... Somebody said, what are cool numbers? Numbers that are below 60 degrees. That's a, a funny um, way to measure things. Uh, in Celsius, that certainly wouldn't be true. So I guess cool numbers depend on the system you're using. Um, but that it would be a funny way to measure angles because angles are usually measured in degrees. You could call it like, instead of an acute triangle, you call that like a cold triangle because it's less than 90 degrees, <laughs> you know? Um, Anyway, um, what else has been going on around the combo classroom? I have so many episode notes piling up and I really hope I can get back to my schedule of filming and editing more productively. There's a lot of personal things that went on in my life I can't give full details about right now. Hopefully someday in either memoirs or later episodes or streams. Look at the squirrel. I will be able to, but uh, for now, I'm gonna skip some of the details, but a lot of hard personal stuff happened. Then I got sick. But now we're going to come back on a new era. 2024, I have a little like numerical lucky thought about, which is I have mentioned before that I think having like silly versions of like almost superstitious type, but on the lucky side uh, could be fun. Like if you have a superstition, come on, why make it spooky? I mean, spooky in a fun way. Sure. But why make it like that means my day's bad? You'll get a placebo effect that your day is bad. Why not have your superstition be, oh, that's a lucky thing for me? Because then, uh, you know, it, as long as you know that it's, you know, a little joke, you're not actually predicting the future, you're having a little fun, your humans are allowed to use their imagination. You don't have to only be less than 10 years old to use your imagination. You could be like, that's a good luck charm. I want to have a little placebo effect whenever I see that. So, if you're going to have those, why not make them be good luck charms and not bad luck charms? So like when I see a 13, I'm more likely to be like, ooh, lucky than unlucky, which it, some people consider it in the culture. But with that said, you know, I, I'm sure someday I'll make an episode that's like roasting certain modern superstitions. We do have to say it. Horoscopes are complete bullshit sorry but they are they use affirmative language that applies to everyone and yet they still don't describe people perfectly they it's like the magician tricks where it's like i sense that you have had a trauma within your past four years with someone in your family and people are like how'd you know it's like Really, who on earth practically hasn't had someone in their family had some sort of trauma in the past four years? Like the horoscopes will say things like, you enjoy when people appreciate you. It's like, well, who doesn't that apply to? <laughs> so of course they will um, 
uh, if you're looking for it, you can get a good confirmation bias off it. Uh, we're going to have to deconstruct those someday because for fun, I looked up like my fuller birth chart on some things the other day. And it was just like complete confirmation bias with vague statements of all time that apply to everyone. And then whenever they made a more specific statement, it was like 50-50 if it applied to me. Uh, I remember telling an old coworker who believed in astrology, do you think you could guess my sign? And she was like, oh, absolutely. I, I, I'm pretty sure I know what it is. And I was like, okay, try and guess. Okay, so there's 12 signs. Uh, this was a coworker who knew me for multiple months. We worked for many eight hour days together and she thought due to knowing astrology that she could predict my sign. There are 12 signs. It took her 11 guesses. So it, that's just like far worse than if you had been blindly, randomly guessing by like rolling dice. Um, of course, that won't always be the case, but you get this funny thing where like if you tell somebody sometimes if somebody really cares about astrology, I can't help but first tell them the wrong sign and just to notice that they'll go. Oh, I knew it. I absolutely knew you were that sign. And then you're like, no, actually, I, I'm not. I'm this other sign. I was just like curious if you were like that committed to whatever I said. Then a lot of the people will say, oh, I knew that too, actually. The second sign was the type who lies about having a first sign. But I bet if you did a third layer, they'd say, oh, I knew that one too. At, at what point does that not make sense? If you do that on the 11th time, oh, I, I actually knew it all along because uh, the 11th sign you said is the type that lies on 10 signs first. It's like, come on. You're like, you any possible stopping point, you'll find a way to make an answer. But um, we'll do a more thorough criticism of astrology in the future someday. For now, that was just a funny note that my version of that, that I actually like to have fun with, is finding little lucky things that I know are placebos, but that I say that's a lucky charm. And one of those is finding special numbers and things. And if the year is a special number, it's kind of cool. I also get a little placebo effect by calendar shifts of it's a fresh start, sort of like people with New Year resolutions. Each month, sometimes I'm like, oh, it's November. I get a fresh start. I get to like drop all my problems and now it's a new mission and I'm going to be a, do all this new projects in November or whatever. Now it's December. This is my new thing. So uh, sometimes I placebo myself with it being the first of a month. The first is maybe just an important lucky number. But another important one are types of numbers I enjoy. And if they line up with a year, that's pretty cool. Like 2025, in a few years from now, is going to be a square number. What is the square root of 2025 to make sure I get it right? It's 45 squared. But what about 2024? That doesn't seem like as crazy of a number, or does it? 2024 is a tetrahedral number. Those are one of the forms of what I call metatriangular numbers, and they relate to Pascal's triangle that was mentioned earlier. And tetrahedral numbers I've been waiting to make episodes about that will relate to all those Pascal's triangle ones I mentioned earlier in the stream. And I think I'm going to need to buy 2024 of some sort of marble-like item and a lot of glue and make a pyramid of 2024 spheres. Because next year's tetrahedral, baby. So, that's, uh, you know, that's a good sign for a fresh start. We get a tetrahedral year, then a square year. That's pretty cool. Someone says 12 is a lucky number. 12 is awesome. One of the first ever combo class episodes was about like, what does a ruler, a clock, and a calendar have in common? The number 12. Why? Because it's something called a highly composite number. 5040 that was mentioned in that comment is also highly composite. Now, ooh, we'll talk more about those highly composites later too. Those are a magnificent type of number. Somebody said, do I still play RPGs that use a D20 system? Uh, I actually never did. I played a lot of make-believe games with my friends as a kid when I was like eight or whatever, where it's like, 
now imagine we're going down the dark hallway. You see a weird wizard. What do you do? So I would do a lot of games that we didn't really involve dice with. It was more like you just had a game maker and a game or uh, one or two game players of the friends who would be like, oh, now I do this. And the game maker just tries to make it fun. And, you know, you have to make it fair in some metric to make it fun. So we, we would just try and be fun game makers to each other and not really use D20 systems. You'd more like know in your head if you were the game maker, like if they do this to the wizard, this will happen. If they do that to the wizard, this will happen or whatever. Uh, we would do a lot where we were in like fictional weird schools or universes or uh, realms or things. Then the D20s, if you've seen me have those, are partially I bought a lot. Because uh, I got a bulk a uh, bunch of dice for combo class because they're very useful. And now a bunch are embedded in the ground as our dice carpet over there and all over the desk. Maybe not D20s, but we certainly have a lot of dice around. But uh, so I got a bunch because they're very useful for my episodes. They're, they look cool and they explain things about probability. They explain things about geometry because they come in different shapes like platonic solids and such. And... So dice are super cool. They're, you know, shapes and they represent different ranges of numbers in a probability-esque way. And before that, if I had D20s, they would have been for this game, Magic. So maybe if that was, is in the category of an RPG, if that's what you meant, then this I played from when I was like 8 to 13 or something or like 7 to 12 or something. Uh, then kind of stopped playing it and like ignored it until like half a year ago when I like was bored or in a bad mood or something and like looked back into it for some reason because the math behind it came up in something and then I realized I got really back into it not like buying new cards or going to events or anything but like analyzing the math of the cards and taking notes about the math of the pool of 30,000 ish cards they've released so far, which decks have destroyed tournament formats and such. Many of these notes being to instruct myself if I design a card game for things to avoid so that we can skip over many flaws. Um, you know, which, which things made it too easy for players to win on an early turn in magic or made uh, certain things like that. Somebody's saying a spin down die. Uh, I don't really know the full details. I assume a spin down is just uh, one that's like a 20 sided or whatever that they are in order where they're like, e like instead of four being opposite three, four would be next to three. So you can roll them down or whatever. And yeah, they were used to represent elements. Like someone said, that was an episode way back in grade negative one. If anyone's curious called the mysterious hyper dice sequence, uh, in, rep, mentioned some of that stuff and a bunch of other random stuff. Uh, but I will make an episode before too long about uh, my calculations of the best and worst magic cards of all time and what the what that tells us in general about card design. Like the best magic cards of all time are going to be ones that are so powerful in comparison to the other cards and in comparison to the cost system of being able to play cards that I wouldn't want something like that in a game I developed. And so we'll take notes about, you know, you don't want to let players draw too many cards too easy. If you have a cost system, you don't want to let them hack easy costs out of things too easy. If you have, uh, th there's various lessons we can learn. So that'll be a fun, long episode sometime. That'll be like mostly my computer screen and like narration or something. Or maybe I might buy what are called proxy versions that are like fake versions of the cards. Not to like fake to use in a tournament or sell or whatever, but to use as a prop. I might buy like a fake proxy of all the cards I'm talking about. And that'd be kind of cool just to actually have like, like I'll say it's a proxy. I don't want people thinking I'm like, rich as hell if I like light what looks like a black lotus on fire or anything. So I'll say they're proxies at the beginning. People get mad enough when I break old bro already broken computers and they somehow assume that it was a new computer and I'm like really wasteful or something. So I better not like uh, even set a proxy black lotus on this table. That's like the most expensive card, by the way. Better not even set one of those on this table without being like, this is fake, people. I have like zero money so that you know. Um, 
with all of our cool funds coming most a little bit from YouTube ad revenue, but pretty much from things like our Patreon supporters. Thank you, folks. And uh, so I'm going to see how if it's expensive, if it's worth it to buy like a fake version of the cards I'm going to talk about, or I might just put them on the screen. But that'll be coming up at some point. What are the most powerful? Some people may think we'll be discussing um, a classic metric of those, which is these ones called the Power Nine, which are like held in high esteem as the nine. In a way, most like they're not exactly now that there are so many cards out, but they're like among the most expensive and among the most powerful of all cards. And they are at a time, there was probably a time where those nine were simultaneously considered the most powerful nine and the most expensive nine. And some are better than others though. And the power nine is not the end of the story. There are some cards that I think are, I'm going to mention what I think are the most powerful cards in magic under different weird metrics. You might, even if you play magic and you think, you know, which ones I'll talk about, there are other metrics we could find to that one might be the best in some edge case way of measuring it. And with those metrics, we're only going to, on like the end, the main like 10 or so, I will say are the top. Only two or three of them are gonna be on the power nine. A lot of them are not those ones. It's, there's a lot of other ones. So that will be maybe fun for people or maybe some people will find it boring. At some point, I'll also do an episode fully explaining the cost system that I developed for my game. But the next main combo class episode will be more just about a more thorough explanation about um, these things we drew, about how numberations, as I'm calling an operation and then number, like times four or divided by two or whatever, how numberations uh, lead to different patterns in different bases. So I'll try and get that out within a week on the Combo Class channel and get some bonus content on this channel. Um, I'll try and get some short out tomorrow or something. I want to jump back into action. I feel like I've been slacking on here, but I got an excuse. I've been genuinely sick. So I'm going to wrap up our stream shortly. Let me know if anyone has any final comments. And thanks so much to all the people who just leave the nice ones. Just like, oh, I love your videos. Your content's cool. That stuff's always appreciated. Um, love all the combo lords who just watch and find any portion of it interesting. And we will be back with a lot more wild antics soon. I have a lot more crazy stuff I haven't shown you folks yet. And a lot more crazy stuff I haven't told you folks about yet. And there will be a lot more fun adventures coming up. So, thank you to anyone who joined me in this live stream. I am going to cap it off there now that we are past like an hour and a half or so. And I don't want to strain my voice out too much. You, you may notice it's still a, on the hoarser end. But good enough to get back to filming and having fun around our crazy combo classroom. All right. Love you all. And I'll catch you 